Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, and today we're going to talk about Australia, New Zealand, and that area of the world with Carl Baker, who is Senior Advisor of Pacific Forum. Uh, so welcome to the show, Carl. I think there's a lot to cover here. And in fact, people aren't covering it enough. So good for us. Sure. And it's good to be back. And it's always fun to talk about uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the rest of Oceania or the Pacific, whatever we want to use the term, whatever term we want to use today. But uh, it's certainly an important part of the world that does tend to get forgotten. I guess antipodes is is sort of a, a moniker that sticks and has some resonance uh, today, given that even though we're not British, we still tend to forget that there's another side to the world. In a funny way, it's the most remote place, I mean, of the civilized world. It's way down, way south, um, and it's very, very, very remote. And I told you before the show that it reminded me of On the Beach with Gregory Peck, 1959 black and white movie, where he commands an American submarine, and it is completely remote, um, and they don't know what happened to the U.S., and this is after a nuclear war. And so uh, this is the most remote part of the world for a nuclear submarine, and that's the experience uh, in this fictitious scenario. Um, but it does emphasize how far away Australia and New Zealand really are in so many ways. And yet, you know, when, we, when you think about what the Americans today are talking about, the Indo-Pacific, it's very much central to that part of the world. It's the Indian Ocean, the nexus between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And hence, I think, why it still matters to the United States. Oh, it's got to because, I mean, it's in the periphery of China, and China is, uh, what do I say, our most effective, uh, most um, advanced competitor. So all, all of us, would you, would you agree with me, Carl, that our interest in that area, our interest in being in the quad, uh, in bringing those countries into our national security, global security effort, is based largely around China. Sure, I, I think it is. I mean, I, and and you know, I mean, the whole idea of expanding the focus from Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific, I think, is is part of an effort to to sort of broaden the security picture to to force China into recognizing that the Americans have influence in a much broader area than just the Asia Pacific. And, and we actually extend our influence and interest into the Pacific Ocean. Now, I think what, what has surprised the United States is first the, the willingness of the Chinese to engage in the Pacific Islands. You know, for so many years, the United States just always kind of considered uh, the, the Pacific Islands as, as captive territory for the United States with the, with the uh, compact, a free association with Micronesia, Palau, and, and um, um, Marshall Islands, you know, that we just sort of felt that that was ours, and we somewhat neglected those countries, you know, and, and including in, in Melanesia, you know, the Solomons and Vanuatu and Tuvalu, you know, we, we sort of neglected those countries. And I think as, as China saw that as an opening, uh, the United States sort of recognized that, ooh, maybe we shouldn't be quite so confident that this is really our backyard and going to remain our backyard. So what you've seen over the last couple of years is we've re reinstated uh, embassies in some of those small countries. Uh, we've we've certainly shown more interest. We've certainly hustled to get the the compact free association agreements finished. And uh, you know I think that there's a recognition that there is competition for for the interests of those countries. And you know, I, you know the last show we did we talked a little bit about this and. I don't think it's just purely on the part of Chinese. I don't think it's purely security interest. It's or military security interest as much as it is economic interest. You know, I think that that it's fair to say that that there are economic interests for China in the the South China Sea or in, in I'm sorry in in the South Pacific. You know, there's 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 a lot of fish out there. There's a lot of a lot of resources in the in the Pacific Ocean that are legitimate targets for uh, Chinese interests. So it, I don't want to portray it as, as purely a military security sort of competition. It's also an economic competition. And that's where I think uh, the United States gets nervous because we don't do economic competition as well as we do military competition. 
Mm, so true. So um, uh, I think you spell that with an M, by the way, manganese. M stands for manganese. Someday there'll be a song about manganese. It's all down there. And, you know, we build more cell phones, more computers, more, you know, exotic electronic equipment. We need uh, rare materials like that. And it's down there at the seabed. Uh, and and they, they are way ahead of us. Uh, they are way ahead of us in fishing, too, I might add. But, you know, uh, you're right. And the, and the problem is that it's hard to, it's you know, are we are we matching them stroke for stroke in this competition, or is this catch up? Because to me, it sounds like catch up. They already have a, a significant presence in Fiji. I know that we've had a show about that, um, and they have a significant presence, developing even a, a more mm, engaged presence with the Solomon Islands right now. Been the subject of some news. So they are reaching east across all of these areas. And I agree that it's largely, you know, what do you want to call it, economic. But it also extends their security, doesn't it? Uh, it sure, it does. And, and you know, don't forget, the other player here is Taiwan, because the, there's several, there were several Pacific Island countries that had maintained the relationship with Taiwan. Now, you can say that it was because Taiwan was feeding them money. And it was it was really a a, a a a competition between China and Taiwan for who was going to provide the best uh, economic package to some of these countries. And to some extent, that's true. But it was it was also uh, you know Taiwan recognizing that there's a lot of resources out there and that it it was an opportunity for them to maintain some diplomatic ties with with countries that are part of the United Nations. So you know so China. I wouldn't say that we're really playing catch up as much as we are recognizing that China is catching up. And so I think that's the difference. So again, going back, you know, it was we we were so confident that we didn't have to do anything that we we sort of let it let it deteriorate. And and now we're recognizing that we do need to do something. So it's not so much catching up as realizing that China is catching up. Well, let me let me add some thoughts and see how you feel about this. Number one is, uh, you know, Barack Obama was doing the pivot, um, but but the pivot didn't last that long as such, because we wound up pivoting shortly thereafter to the Middle East and Europe, mm -hmm. which which is where we're spending a lot of time and money. Not enough, in my opinion, but yeah. we're spending a lot of time and money there. Um, and so we we've um, we haven't really been as um, as um, engaged in the West Pacific, the South Pacific, as perhaps we should have been. And so the pivot, you know, is like old already. The other thing is that uh, the Quad is kind of old too. Um, the Quad is not a picture of excitement and uh, heavy collaboration. Uh, the U.S. is the center of it and it holds it together. Um, but why only four of them? Why not other countries too? Why doesn't the U.S. bring in others? And when you ask the, you know, the members, they say, well, you know, this is a very loose association. Um, this is not like NATO or anything like that. Uh, we're just sort of hanging out together. Um, and so this, this gives me a certain level of concern that the quad and the pivot are old news. Uh, well, I mean, the pivot, you know, the pivot, is, I, I would agree. I think the quad... The Quad is an evolution, but to me, the Quad is mostly about figuring out how we can integrate India into our defense posture in the broader region, again, called the Indo-Pacific. I think that's the real motivation behind the Quad. You know, it, it back back in the, the early 2000s, it was the idea that, that the, these are four democracies that can work together, you know, including India as one of the, one of the big democracies. And you know, and this was really Shinzo Abe back in 2007 that that sort of tried to start the Quad. I think the Quad has new residents, but not so much about the in the context of the pivot as it is in the context of the recognition that we need allies and partners to uh, deter, if you will, China. So I think that's that's really what the Quad is about. But what what we've seen, I think, in you know post, let's just say the post-Trump administration in in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, you know, Trump is the one that actually started the idea of the Indo-Pacific, or it started during Trump's administration. But what Biden has done with it is he has really, I think, focused the attention on 
broadening the partnerships in Asia to the extent that we now no longer say United States is dominant. So I, in some ways you have to disagree, I have to disagree with your characterization of the United States driving the quad. The idea behind the quad is to get buy-in from Japan, Australia, and India for the defense cooperation in Asia and the Indo-Pacific broader, because I think the United States recognizes it can't do it by itself. So in some ways, the, the, the current version of the Quad is a reflection of the recognition in the United States that it needs help to actually deter China in that region. Mm, do, uh, do they see us as, uh, as strong as they used to see us? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that we really haven't backed up Taiwan enough. Although I, I read that uh, Biden is uh, offering some huge multi-billion dollar incentive to the Taiwan uh, Semiconductor Company, um, SMC, TMSC. TSMC, yeah, Taiwan Semiconductor. And, uh, and I say to my, gee, I hope, that, hope the Chinese don't invade and take all that over. We, we lose the investment. <laughs> well, it, I mean, the news, the news of today is that uh, he's providing that money to, for them to build the a third fabrication plant in Phoenix. So not to worry. Oh, no, no, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the sooner the better they do that. Um, but anyway, so we haven't really, you know, um, d defended and uh, uh, shown uh, support of Taiwan as much as they wanted. Um, and, um, you know, I, I thought we were moving a lot of troops um, into uh, what, uh, uh, either Okinawa, maybe away from Okinawa. There were troop movements. Guam, was it? And we, yeah. were, moving, we were moving into Pearl Harbor from the mainland, and we were you know, building our security forces, our military, in the Pacific. But I'm not sure that that actually happened yet. Uh, and maybe we're spending more time in Europe and the Middle East. What do you think? Well, yes, we are, but we're also building building the relationship with Australia. I think that's that's where the the real change is occurring. Is that you know we're we're much closer with Australia now with with putting putting that that uh, marine training area in Darwin. You know we're 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 doing a lot more a lot more rotations into of, of fighter aircraft, bombers, and and just ship visits and all that sort of stuff into Australia. You know, so there's a much more robust defense relationship between the United States and Australia, you know, including, let's talk about AUKUS, you know, with providing very, very controversially providing nuclear submarines to a non-nuclear non weapon state, Australia, which is significant yes. because that, that basically gives them the technology to develop nuclear weapons. Not that, not that Australia is going to do that, or at least we don't think they are, but I mean, it, it's it's a dramatic change in the mindset in the United States. And again, I think that all goes back to the effort to integrate Australia, at least, into this broader deterrence package that the United States sees necessary as China develops its uh, its influence in the region. But part of that package is a very interesting piece that I saw, and it's about how the United States is uh, asking Australia to. Um, manufacture weapons mm -hmm. in Australia for use in Ukraine, to give the Ukrainians or sell, whatever the case may be. Um, and I find that a very interesting kind of global connection, if you will. <laughs> the, yeah. US, uh, the U.S. likes to think that it can manufacture as, more than before, um, but here it's asking Australia to manufacture. And to the extent that um, you know somebody has to pay for that, the money for the manufacturer the manufacturing winds up in Australia, not in the U.S. Yeah. So, in, in, uh, I guess you, you you make policy only to make exceptions to policy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, but I think again that that's part of that recognition that the United States is is finding finding it important to have strong partners, and of course, Australia is has traditionally been that strong partner. In, in Asia. So what what happened to New Zealand? You know, you know, I can hardly tell the difference when they talk to me. I mean, if you have a fine ear, you can probably tell one from the other. But usually, I cannot do that. And I like them in terms of their you know their personal personalities and their social skills. But they 
did really different in terms of diplomatic relations and and uh, uh, national policy, aren't they? Uh, yeah, sure, they 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 are. Although they're all they're both fairly dependent economically on their relationship with China. Mm. You know, I mean, when you look at when you look at New Zealand, they do probably twice as much trade with China as they do with the United States. And, you know, over the past couple of years, Australia has realized how economically dependent it's become on China for, for providing raw materials. Uh, from, from New Zealand, it's mostly agriculture products. From, from Australia, it's mostly mining and, uh, and, and resources of, of you know, um, rare earths and whatever they're, they're mining out of the outback in Australia. So both of them are fairly dependent on, on China in terms of their economic uh, well-being. But there's a difference. I'd like to say viva la difference, but there's a difference. Um, you know, they, they don't feel the same way about nuclear weapons, for example. Uh, they're not in the quad. And uh, why not? Well, they're not in the quad. More importantly, they're, they're, although we talk about the ANZUS Treaty, we don't consider uh, New Zealand, the United States does not consider uh, New Zealand as a treaty partner because, because in 1986, they said that we are a nuclear-free country, which means you and your nuclear submarines are not welcome in our waters. And so, you know, in 1986, the United States uh, broke off that relationship. And so, so to this day, now there's talk, you know, in the last just in the last months, that there's there's a push to integrate New Zealand back into that defense relationship. And I think that that there are, there has been movement over the last couple of years, where where New Zealand is now much more of a defense partner than it was say ten years ago. So, you know, so, so they they're they're participating they participate regularly they now regularly participate in in the uh, RIMPAC exercise here in Hawaii. They've established a, a council general here in Hawaii. So you know so they they're they're making these moves and and mo mostly the council general is really. For the purpose of better coordination with uh, with Indo PACOM in in town. Mm. Um, moving to uh, India, mm -hmm. in India is a dem dem democratic country. It's almost as big, or maybe now it's bigger than China in population. Yeah, yeah. It's very prosperous in many ways. It's got, of course, as all dem democracies, it's got social issues and problems. And right now, it seems to have leadership problems in terms of Modi moving to the right, slightly more autocratic than he was at the outset. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's got a very kind of, uh, um, what I say, erratic, um, charismatic style uh, that um, uh, may be good for India, but it may not be good for uh, alliances and its relationship with the U.S. Um, not sure how that's unfolding, not sure why he is with the Quad, why the Quad is with him. But it sounds like um, he's a kind of iffy member of the Quad. What do you think? Well, there's cer there's, certainly they have been the, the outlier in, in terms of the relationship because Japan, the United States, and Australia have other, other partnerships. They have the, they have, they have the trilateral, literally the U.S., Japan, and Australia trilateral that has been in existence for some time. They certainly are are better aligned than with India because India does have a strong defense relationship with with uh, Russia. It's depended on Russia for its military equipment for some time. Partly, uh, just historically, they've been they've been friends with the Soviet Union and then subsequently with Russia, and so they they have a lot of uh, Russian military equipment. Uh, Russia, or I'm sorry, India and Australia haven't always gotten along real well. You know, there's been a there's been a bit of animosity for whatever reason between India and and Australia. So you know, so there's there's a history of of why India is much more independent. You know, India has always been uh, sort of the biggest proponent of the Group of Seventy Seven or the Non-Aligned Movement. So it's always resisted developing a stronger relationship with with everyone, including including the democracies that we're talking about. So you know, so I think for all those reasons, yeah. Uh, India continues to be the outlier, but I think, uh, as as I said earlier, the United States and increasingly Australia and Japan recognize that India is becoming an important partner 
in developing a deterrence network in the Indo-Pacific region, the broader Indo-Pacific region, to to deter uh, China. Mm, yeah, yeah. But I mean, what I, what I what I what I hear though is that uh, the Quad is really not mm, devoted to military security. Right. It's uh, and and also that China is very good at what do we call it. Uh, um, trade diplomacy. In other words, you have a lot of trade with a country, such as you mentioned, with New Zealand, and that brings you closer. Um, and that's the way you know they they enter into relationships. That's the way uh, they get they get closer to all countries that way. And and who could complain? I mean, we should be doing the same thing, actually. Um, so you you wonder how solid the Quad is. You wonder how influential the U.S. is among these countries um, because you know China's working competitively against us and because we can't really control um, it's not like NATO it's not like there's a section five of mutual self-defense um, you know, I'm not sure where it all goes I mean how far can you go with an organization that is not NATO that doesn't have mutual self-defense but is nevertheless interested in mutual security? Uh, yeah, deterrence. Deterrence is your word. Yeah, I'm going to continue to use that word because that's that's very that's an, a very American word, and and India and Australia and Japan aren't quite as convinced that deterrence is the best policy, you know, and that's why they that's why they hold out this economic relationship with China as as something that influences how they interact with China. You know, and so you, what you're seeing now is after, you know, after China basically cut off Australia, Australia has, has backed away from some of its more strident uh, advocacy for, for stronger deterrence because China, China has resisted it. You know, and so the, the economic relationship with China is going to continue to play a part. And I think, you know, that's what, that's what Secretary Yellen has, has acknowledged in her trip to China. Mm -hmm. Is that you cannot ignore that economic relationship. The United States can't, and certainly when you look at at Australia, India, and and New Zealand, they can't. They can't simply ignore the fact that China is a huge economy and that it is a a center for economic well being in that part of the world. Let's talk about Japan. Japan may be a, one of our most uh, Mm. Oh, I don't know, connected countries because of the war, because of what happened after the war, mm -hmm. because of their development uh, since the war. Um, and, you know, and because they, we, we get along with the Japanese, I think, in large part, call it citizen diplomacy. Um, but uh, <laughs> the fact is that they're building up their military, they're spending money on that. Um, they're trying to tell China that they're serious and, and they're not to be trifled with. Um, their economy may not be as good as it was um, a few years ago. Their their bell curve shows uh, that as, you know the population is actually declining. Um, so, query: Where does Japan fit in this? Are they a leader in the Quad? Are they a leader among the what do you want to call it? Uh, the democracies, the enlightened countries of of uh, our influence in Asia? Um, are they going to be more or less in the future? I think they're going to be more in Asia, and and in fact, you know, they're well, they're an important security partner, military security partner with the United States. They're a huge economic partner for everybody in Asia, you know. And I think that that's where Japan has shown real leadership. You know, is they're the ones that after the United States walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they're the ones that really worked to get the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership back in shape. And so now you have Australia, New Zealand, and and some of the south, some of the Southeast Asian countries that are now promoting this CPTPP, and China is knocking on the door trying to get in, you know. So so I think that that Japan has been very successful in in demonstrating and providing economic security leadership in Asia, along with its development programs, along with its investments in the region, you know, and it's you know it's promoting. A, Free trade agreements in the region. So I think I think Japan has very much stepped up in in basically in a vacuum 
that the Americans left when they when they walked away from from the TPP. Mm, interesting. So here now I have a I have a comprehensive question for you. We have Joe Biden, who is uh, troubled uh, domestically, uh, who is troubled in terms of you know defending and supporting Ukraine, who is in a kind of constant uh, uh, contention with uh, Netanyahu about Israel, uh, who is in a growing contention with the, the proxies of Iran. I mean, these are complicated problems. You know, any one of those would take the whole State Department to figure it out. And he's got it every day. And on top of that, he's running for office. Uh, and on top of that, he's got Southeast Asia, and um, he's got the Quad, and you know this this whole area with Australia and New Zealand. I don't know how one individual leader can can do all of that. It's like you go on a cruise ship, and they have two captains. One captain navigates the ship, and the other pays attention to the passengers. It's almost like they should have two presidents: uh, one who navigates the, the country, and the other pays attention to the passengers. But we don't have that. He's going to have to do it all. And the oxygen is being sucked out of the room. Furthermore, um, as one of our hosts said, Donald Trump is looking like um, a president to be. Uh, and uh, he's talking like a president to be, taking positions on international issues and trying to upstage Biden. So you have a confusion as to who is really speaking and going to speak for the country. Here we are, what, six months away from an election that could turn the whole thing upside down. And these countries, Australia, New Zealand, other countries are in and around the quad. They know that. They're watching like a hawk. Mm -hmm. um, how does all of that affect them? Not an easy question. Well, let me start off with a, with a, with a somewhat snide answer. We have the vice president. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> more importantly. <laughs> um, you know, I think that what what Biden, what the Biden administration has done is it's made it more difficult for the United States to simply walk away from the Indo-Pacific region by by working with the allies, by by developing some some level of multilateral interaction with these countries. I think it's become it's made it more difficult for a an incoming president to simply walk away from the Indo-Pacific. And say China, it's all yours, you know. So I think that that's what they've done. Now, whether the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is successful or not, I think is an open question. We certainly haven't done enough on trade, but again, Japan has. Japan has kind of filled that vacuum. The United States has done has done IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Indo Economic Framework, and at least it has put in some components of that program. So. I, and 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 just the fact that you know the quad, the AUKUS, the the other relationships that we've developed with with the uh, with the Southeast Asian countries and certainly with Japan and you know improved relations between Japan, South Korea, and the United States. I think it, the current administration has made it more difficult for anybody to follow on and simply walk away from it. So I think that that's that I'll, I'll say that. And then I'll again give Japan credit for sort of taking up the economic piece. So, if uh, one of these countries in Indo Pacific should come to you, let's make you the State Department today, the whole enchilada, the whole State Department, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, and say, you know, uh, Carl, we're a little concerned about what happens in this election. Um, we, we don't know where we stand with Trump. Um, uh, we we know his machinations. We see we read the same papers you read, um, and we don't know what to do. How do we how do we see this? How do we look at this in terms of the very real possibility there'll be a change in regime that will be mm, profound uh, in 2025? And, and again, I go back and say, you know, just con continue to build resiliency to to integrate into a broader multilateral framework that entices the United States to stay engaged economically, and that and that build that economic framework that that makes it important for the United States to stay engaged if they want to maintain the economic relationship in Asia. 
And because because right now we're dependent on those other countries to do that. Right now, with, without without a free trade agreement with anybody in Asia other than you know Japan, it's very difficult. And South Korea, it's very difficult to maintain that economic relationship. So I think that that's that's the angle I would tell those countries to take. For Australia, I think it's a little bit different. Australia just isn't a big enough economy to matter in in some ways to the United States, and so their part is much more focused on security build the security relationship with the partners that the United States has now, Japan, Philippines, uh, to some extent, New Zealand. You know, but I think that that's, that's the angle that I would recommend that Australia take. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. Japan, certainly the economic side. Australia, the, the security side. Uh, others, uh, you know, find a way to, to force, force an integration of economic interests with the United States. Yeah, there was an article in Foreign Affairs that I saw a few days ago, and it was about how you have to maintain your morality. Um, and we haven't always done that. I mean, sometimes we've capitulated for practical purposes, for you know the self-interest of the United States. And of course, those are regrettable instances where we have shoved off from our own morality. Um, but there should be, don't you think, uh, whatever we do, there should be a, a fundamental level of... Mm, the, uh, the world, liberal world order and morality. And whatever we do with any country has to reflect that. Uh, am I right? Does this apply here? Well, it, it does apply here. And I mean, and, and the, the glaring example, of course, is while, you know, the United States wants to find the difference between what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in Israel and Gaza, the rest of the world uh, doesn't quite see it that way. <laughs> You know, and so yeah, that's a perfect example of of the what is seen in the rest of the world as American hypocrisy. You know, and yeah, mm-hmm. it extends back into history. I mean, there's there's any number of of articles that have been written about how we were friends with the South Korean uh, regime back in, back in the seventies, and Chiang Kai Shek in in Taiwan. These people weren't exactly. Uh, uh, shining examples of democracy. Yeah. So now I change the facts on you. I think you've already told us what Joe Biden should do if he's reelected. Um, but what about Trump? Well, a, what what would Trump do from his remarks, his comments so far? Um, you know, Indo Pacific, um, and what and uh, what should he do? What would he do? What should he do? Well, I, uh, what I think what he would do is remember he's the one that actually came up, or his administration is the is the administration that came up with the idea of promoting this Indo-Pacific. So you know, I think the way the way Trump views it is big, strong military, whatever that means. It, it, it's really a marketing term for him, and so you know, so just just say you have a big, strong military and everything will be okay. Uh, and and if if China gets out of line, well, we'll we'll threaten them with nuclear weapons or something. You know, I mean, I think that's sort of the mindset of of Trump, and I don't think it goes much beyond that. What he should do, of course, is continue to do what we've been doing, only integrate a better economic box. You know, it strikes me that um, you know deterrence is an interesting concept. If you are the biggest kid on the block, yeah. <clears throat> Um, but if you're not the biggest kid on the block and everybody's doing escalation of weapons and preparation for war, you have the um, the Barbara Tuckman guns of August scenario uh, mm-hmm. where, you know, everybody gets m- more weaponized. And then one day you know, there's a, a trigger and it, uh, it, it, it everybody goes to war all at the same time. <clears throat> and so. When the United States says, oh, we're going to be, we're going to spend a trillion dollars a year on defense and we're going to have every weapon known, uh, I'm not sure that solves the problem in a world where there are people who are trying to outsmart us on weapons and, and prepare just as we prepare for the possibility of war, call it deterrence or preparation, either way. Uh, and, that, and that with that in mind, um, perhaps all this deterrence is really uh, a path to war. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree, and I mean, and that's that's why that's sort of the 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 
uh, emptiness of of Trump's version of deterrence is just build more, just build more weapons and say you have a big military and you're strong and you 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 have this this aura about yourself. I mean, it's much it's much of a of a of a of a a, a what's the word I'm looking for a transference of his own grandness onto the onto the country, you know, which sort of fits his his model of what he what he sees his relationship with the United States sometimes. I think that that he he envisions the United States as an extension of himself. And you know, and just just talk big, talk talk like a bully and everybody will be deferential to. And you know, and, and that doesn't work in the world in the world today. Like, as you say, you know, when you've got a, a, a Russia that continues to develop its military, you've got a China that has the resources to develop a very big, strong military and have influence in the region, then that sort of deterrence, exactly, it, 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 it is ultimately a self-defeating concept because deterrence only works as long as you are the biggest bully in the valley. And, and it's, been, it's become very clear that we're not. And that's why I, I was talking about, you know, what, what the Biden administration has recognized is the importance of developing true security partners, not security partners that will tell you what to do, now go do it. It's it's true partners who actually have a say in how we develop those plans, how we develop our, our relationship. And so, you know, that's why the economic piece becomes so important and why Japan has become such an important player, because they are the the country today that is carrying that economic mantle in Asia to integrate those Asian economies so that they're not completely dependent on China, that they have some resilience on their own. You know, and IPEF plays a part of that by developing a, a, a supply chain resilience and, and a recognition of the importance of rules and, and, and governing green and green energy and things like that. But it's, it takes more than just that. It takes a, a true partnership with all these countries to develop an, an economic approach that can compete with China rather than letting China be the big eco economic engine that, that is the focal point for everybody in Asia. And so. Sounds like a full-time job to me. <clears throat> you know, foreign affairs, um, diplomacy uh, has never been so complicated and nuanced and required so many relationships and the maintenance of so many connections and dealing with so many issues around the world. It's really a, a, a head ringer. And um, I'm hoping that whoever is in office, they can handle this because the stakes are, are so high. Uh, have you ever seen foreign affairs, diplomacy, foreign relations, all these issues so complicated as they are right now? Well, I, no, I haven't, because you know, because we've I, we grew up. You and I grew up in the Cold War, you know, and so we recognized that, and it was it was about security, about military security, and and the economic piece was always well. The United States is big, and it can absorb any amount of goods that people can deliver. And now we're to the point where we, the Americans, are limiting. We have limited resources. We recognize that we can't absorb all the product that the, the country, the world can grow. And so now we have to find partners who are willing to do that. And that's why China becomes important because it can absorb that, that economic growth. India can absorb that. And we have to acknowledge that, that those are becoming the areas that need to be integrated into that global economic system. And we can't, we can't limit ourselves through industrial policy by saying we're, we're going to exclude those countries or we're going to exclude those economies. We need to figure out how to build an economic security mechanism that allows us to integrate ourselves into that economy, into that global economy. And that's, I think, the challenge. The military security, we've got that down. What we don't have down is how we develop a global economic strategy that allows us to do something other than just absorb product from, it, from the rest of the world. And we can't do any of that if we're going to be isolationist. We really have to have a better narrative. Right. Carl Baker, thank you, Carl Baker, uh, Senior Advisor to Pacific Forum. These are really great discussions and enlightening, thoughtful comments. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.